Hi everyone! Now that you know the difference between sheep and goats from our last lesson, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the most important goat breeds for the industry. So number 62 is going to be the Alpine goat, and they're named that because they originated in the French Alps. Um, because of that, they're adapted to rocky, dry mountain areas with extreme temperatures and really sparse vegetation. So that makes these guys very hardy and very agile. They can live on pretty much any kind of terrain. This is the most popular dairy goat breed, and they are specifically bred to produce good milk for Chev. Remember, that was that goat cheese. Um, so because of that, they have really large udders, and they have a high milk yield with high protein and butter fat content. They also make really good pack goats if they're trained while they're young, and these were the ones that I actually took out with my uncle into the mountains. They were alpines. Um, they are medium to large size, around 135 pounds at, when they're full grown, and most are either primarily tan or gray with black lines down their back and down their underline, um, but they do come in a variety of colors as you can see. This is the only goat breed with erect ears, so if you look at their ears, they're standing up and some have beards, and then some also have this genetic um, thing called a wattle, which is pretty cool. You can see it in this picture right here. Um, so these little things protruding from their neck are wattles, and it is just a genetic thing that some of them will have. No one's really sure of the purpose, but there is some speculation and some early studies that think that these wattles may actually help with their immune system in some way, like they may store good bacteria. And alpine goats do come in pulled and horned varieties. When they have horns, they're long and they're curved and they point upwards, almost like an antelope's horns. Our next goat is the angora, which comes from Turkey. They're an ivory color with pink skin, which you can see at their noses. They have long curly hair and upright tails and long floppy ears that point forward. So they kind of scoop towards the front of their body. They all have horns and those will start to curve out into the sides when they're long. And they are a fiber breed. They're actually the most efficient fiber producer of any species, not just goats, but any animal that we raise for fiber. And their fiber is referred to as mohair. So I know it's kind of confusing because they're called angora goats and there is an angora fiber, but that's actually produced by rabbits. Um, so the fleece from these guys would be called mohair and they have a really friendly and calm demeanor, but unfortunately they're not very hardy. They're most suited to dry Southwestern states and Texas is actually our largest mohair producer in the US. These guys are shorn like sheep for lustrous, silky, soft fiber that's used in luxury cloth. And they do grow that fiber so quickly that they have to be shorn at least twice a year. So at this point, I'd like you to pause here and watch the video that I've linked to from YouTube on how they're actually shorn and what that process looks like. All right, welcome back. Now that you've seen them shorn, um, one thing that you need to be aware of is that Angora fiber quality is really largely dependent on nutrition. So these guys prefer to eat brush and weeds and that kind of thing, but they usually need supplemental hay and grain to make sure that that mohair is going to be really high quality. Number 64 is the boar goat, and you say it almost like you're bored. That's how you pronounce it. Um, so these boar goats were bred in South Africa in the early 1900s, and because they were in such a hot area, they were bred to be mostly white, and that way they don't overheat easily. A lot of them do have a brown or black hood that comes over their face and neck area, and that actually reduces the glare from the sun around their eyes, because we know that darker colors will absorb sunlight, so it actually absorbs right in that area instead of reflecting, and that reduces their glare. They have long floppy ears that scoop forward just a little bit, but they're much wider than the Angora's ears and their horns curve backwards right around their head and stay pretty close to that hood that they have. They are smaller horns than other breeds of the same size as well. These guys have a very rounded face. You can see how it just doesn't really slope down much at all. It has this gentle curve and a short muzzle and upright tails again. 
and they have very blocky bodies. So you can probably tell that they're bred from meat because again, we see that very squarish shape that we've seen in all of our meat animals so far. It produces a very lean meat with 2.5% less fat than chicken. And while goat meat is not yet very popular in the US, it is popular around the world um, and it is a major protein source for a lot of people. It's becoming more popular <clears throat> in the US as certain cuisines kind of bring it in. 65 is another fiber goat, and this is one that you've probably heard of, even if you didn't know that it came from a goat, and that is cashmere. Um, so that, that is that luxury fiber that's really expensive um, because it's known for being really soft and really silky. So these cashmere goats come in many colors, but the most common and the most sought after is white because, again, that's going to take dye easier than other colors. When they... Um, when you look at their ears and you're trying to compare these guys to the Angora goats, remember the Angora's ears really kind of scooped forwards and they were very, very floppy. If you look at these guys' ears, they go straight out to the side a lot more than the Angora did. Another big difference between the Cashmere and the Angora is the shape of their fiber itself. See how this is very long, straight fiber? It might be slightly wavy, but it doesn't have much of a wave in it. Whereas if we look back at the Angora, see how this is tightly spiraled? This looks a lot more like sheep's wool um, for their mohair than the cashmere does. Cashmere is much straighter. In addition, where those Angora horns would kind of curve down and back and out, these guys go almost more straight out to the side. So these kind of wind up looking like the Texas long longhorn of goats, um, where they are going straight out like that. And they can get quite long too, as you can see in this guy up here. Uh, they also tend to have really thick beards on the males, and that's another way that you can kind of tell them apart. And for any of these fiber breeds, and when we get to alpacas, same kind of story, the fleece is going to really be processed the same way as sheep's wool. They're going to be shorn. It's going to have to be washed and go through all of the same steps. Number 66 is the kinder goat. This is a Nubian pygmy goat cross, and we haven't gotten to either of those breeds yet, but we will shortly. They were bred in the 1980s in Washington state, and they're actually still in early stages of their breed development. They're dual purpose, so they were bred to produce almost as much milk as larger breeds, but they're more manageable because kinders have a really small body size compared to other breeds, and they have very friendly personalities. The weathers of this um, breed make really good meat animals because they have high dressing percentages. Because kinder goats are really pretty early in their composite breed development, they do vary a lot in terms of their traits. So there's not a lot of really reliable things to look at other than they're going to be on the smaller side of things. Their ears do tend to always point outwards, but they might flop slightly if they have a little bit more of that Nubian variety in them. They do also tend to have a very curved spine, which is going to produce this dip in their back that you see in these guys here. Their tail points up and out, and they never have horns. They're always pulled. Their muzzle and ears are often either white or a lighter color, and you can see that in all of these guys. Um, and their milk tends to be sweeter and higher in butterfat than most other breeds. So this is ideal milk for making goat's cheese and making soap because of that extra fat. And it's also an excellent drinking milk. So we're going to see a couple other kind of mini breeds. Um, and the way to tell them apart, these guys are always a little bit larger. So they're more of a medium size. And then these are the dual purpose one where your other ones are going to be bred specifically for one purpose or another. Number 67 is the La Mancha. And La Manchas were first bred in Oregon in the 1950s. They're actually thought to have descended from Spanish goats that were brought out to California when it was first settled. And these guys are really easy to identify because of their ears. If you look, it almost looks like they have no ears, but they do actually have ears there. They're just called gopher or elf ears, where it's a wrinkled fold of skin near their head. The gopher ears are actually even shorter. They're not more than one inch, and elf ears are somewhere around two inches in length, so they would be a little bit longer. Elf ears will be, have more cartilage than gopher ears for that reason. These guys may have beards, as you see in this picture, 
and they are a medium-sized dairy breed. They're known for their high milk production and comparatively high butter fat content. And they do come in a variety of different colors, as you can see here. Number 68 is the Nigerian Dwarf. So this is one of our two mini breeds. And you may be able to tell just from kind of looking at their bodies, you don't see that square shape. So that indicates that this is a dairy breed. So this is the mini breed that is exclusively dairy. Their bones are really flat and their ideal body build is more delicate. Um, so they have that kind of refined angularity of a dairy animal where you're going to see some of their bones sticking out a little more than you would with a meat animal. The structure of their hindquarters is really important so that it allows for a good udder development, especially when you have an animal this small. There has to be plenty of space there. Um, and they're known for their milk production and also the longevity of the mammary system. Unlike in a cow where you're only going to be able to milk them for a certain amount of time, their udders can hold up to longer milking. So in the show ring, the udder actually accounts for 40% of their total score. These guys are also really popular in petting zoos because they stay small, so they're friendly and they're neat to have around kids. Number 60 is the Nubian. In other parts of the world, it's actually called the Anglo-Nubian goat. So these guys originated in England, hence the Anglo uh, prefix on that, but their ancestors also included goats from India, Russia, and Egypt. These guys are easy to pick out for a couple reasons. One is their fairly large size. The other is that they have these large spoon-shaped floppy ears that curl towards the front. And they have this very rounded forehead with what's called a Roman nose, which is when it kind of bumps out here and is even larger. Um, and that particular set of traits you're also going to remember from the kinder goats, because remember kinder goats are Nubian pygmy goat crosses. So a lot of those kinder goats look like little mini Nubian goats for that reason. So Nubian goats are actually one of the breeds that I worked with in a dairy, um, and they are milking goats. They're, they come in many different colors, but most of them have some sort of reddish tint to their color, and they are a very large breed compared to the rest. So their shoulders are going to stand somewhere usually around your waist or higher. Um, due to their Middle Eastern heritage, these goats can live in really hot climates, and they also have a longer breeding season than other dairy goats. And their milk is known for high butterfat content and superior flavor, um, and they are the second most popular milking goat after an alpine. And the last goat breed I'd like you to know about is the pygmy. So this is another mini variety that you might see in petting zoos, but you might be able to tell from their body shape that this is a much stouter animal and that is because they are bred for meat. So they have a round, heavy bone structure that's very unlike the fine bones that we saw in uh, the Nigerian dwarf goats, which were the dairy breeds. So these guys are much more thick muscled and much more stout than the Nigerian dwarfs and that's how you're gonna tell them apart. Um, their body circumference is wide and they're known for these very, really full barrels. Think of it as like a pot belly. Um, their necks are short and thick and the overall body length from their head to their tail is very short also for their size. They come in a lot of different colors, but they tend to have a white frosting on any darker colored goats. So the black and the brown goats will have kind of these white tips to their fur. Um, pygmies are also considered a smaller dwarf meat breed again, so they are being bred as meat, although a lot of them are also being kept as pets at this point. And they have beards, so that's another way to tell them apart. And a lot of them have horns similar to alpine goats, so sometimes they will look like mini alpine goats. So look for that thicker body and those alpine goat kind of features to tell them apart from the Nigerian dwarf goats, um, which will have that thinner, fine-boned body. And then the kinders, remember, will be a little bit bigger, tend to have a little bit floppier ears and look a little bit more like those Nubians, although they are Nubian pygmy crosses, so they will have some things in common with these pygmy goats. All right, those are your goat breeds, and study up, so make sure that you can tell them apart.